obtained uh, mainly from the point of view of the primary care physician, which uh, I'm sure uh, you appreciate <coughs> works with a lot of constraint uh, in uh, your clinic, uh, sometimes without the uh, uh, aid of many uh, Changge uh, investigation that uh, somebody like myself uh, has uh, in the tertiary centre. So I, I want to approach uh, this topic in a very uh, practical uh, and uh, what I feel is a, a thought process that will help you to uh, sort out uh, the important pain from the not so important pain. But uh, let me uh, address the, uh, the, the question that was posted in the poster and uh, what do you do uh, is this uh, irritable bowel syndrome uh, and what, do you, what can you do about it? Uh, I'd just like to just address it uh, in a very short, uh, in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a manner that, uh, uh, that seems short, uh, but actually it will be played out uh, in my talk subsequently. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, IBS is a diagnosis of exclusion. You cannot make the diagnosis with certainty uh, without uh, certain investigation. So uh, my job today is to hopefully uh, walk you through uh, what is uh, uh, serious pain and what is not so serious pain. So uh, I'm going to uh, share with you uh, the thought process that I feel is important and I'm going to ask four important questions. Uh, and that is, uh, is this an acute abdomen? First question. Second question, is this COVID infection? The third question, what can you do in your clinic? The fourth question is, uh, when to refer? Uh, I'm sure you appreciate that uh, this will be a very practical uh, kind of thought process. Uh, firstly, how common is abdominal pain uh, in the primary care setting? Uh, I've managed to... Uh, Get a to get hold of a study, uh, more of a survey uh, that actually uh, describe primary care, the kind of three most important pain complaints in primary care in Malaysia, and they are abdominal pain, musculoskeletal pain, and also headaches. Uh, the musculoskeletal pain is including backache uh, and headache and all could either be acute or chronic. But you can appreciate that abdominal pain makes up almost 11.2% uh, of people that uh, present to primary care. Uh, this, uh, this survey, also interestingly, uh, although it's not in the scope of my talk, but <laughs> it's quite interesting that... Uh, uh, Pain is more common, they are more common in patients visiting private clinics than public clinics. Uh, this may be because uh, these patients tend to utilize government clinics more for, uh, you know, chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, and also because uh, maybe of the shorter wait at private clinics. Uh, that was the conclusion of the authors anyway. Uh, and uh, the next slide will show you uh, the age and sex uh, distribution of the patient. And as you can see, uh, interestingly, uh, most of the patients are uh, young female adults making up most of the, uh, I mean, uh, making up most of the, uh, the biggest proportion of patients. Uh, it is, uh, so this, this patient, uh, this young female patient usually present with acute pain. Uh, and uh, in contrast to chronic pain, uh, which is more prevalent in the elderly population. Uh, this could be because uh, young working adults have more access to private clinics uh, and also uh, that they are more articulate and more willing to complain about pain compared to an older population. Uh, this was the conclusion of the author. Uh, so uh, the message of this two slide is that uh, we, it confirms our suspicion as well as your working practice that abdominal pain is actually one of the most common, if not the most common complaint presenting 
at your clinic. Uh, next, we have uh, what about abdominal pain in uh, children? Well, uh, my good friend, uh, Professor Roy, and also uh, Professor Kel Go did a, did a study, uh, you know, almost 20 years ago, looking at Malaysian school children, and they found the prevalence of recurrent abdominal pain to be as high as 10.2%. And that is indeed a very high uh, prevalence. What about in the emergency department? Uh, I don't have a slide uh, for emergency department, but abdominal pain is also the most common reason for pain for visit to the ED. Uh, accounting uh, in uh, a paper in the uh, United States, uh, uh, accounting for almost uh, 7 to 8% of total ED visits. Now, so abdominal pain, by and large, uh, is the most common uh, presentation that you will ever see in your clinic. So it is actually very important to distinguish uh, what, is, uh, in what is how to manage this pain because uh, there are, as you imagine, as you know, there are pain that are very important to like, deal with right now and there are in pain that you can send home. So my first question is actually uh, that you need actually to, un to answer right from the beginning is that, is this an acute abdomen? So, uh, the thought process would be, what, what can this be when someone presents to you uh, with pain? Okay, uh, I like to be systematic. Uh, in the whole abdomen, they can either be gastric, uh, intestinal, uh, or we can go through, uh, you know, you, you list down the uh, differential diagnosis. Can this be a, a, a gastric ulcer, a GERD, uh, you know, a non-ulcer dyspepsia, uh, uh, intestinal, uh, can it be a duodenal ulcer, uh, could it be, you know, uh, Crohn's disease, you know, so on and so forth, uh, colonic, could this be an early presentation of a colonic uh, carcinoma? Uh, well, nobody would like to miss uh, a pancreatic uh, CA. Uh, what about hepatobiliary? Could this be gallstone, one of the most important, uh, one of the most common uh, diagnoses that we have? Uh, could this be uh, cholangitis? Uh, could this be a liver abscess? Uh, could it be from the GU tract? Uh, could it be uh, kidney stones? Uh, could it be uh, uh, kidney carcinoma, uh, uh, kidney cancer? Okay. Or can it be a gynecological uh, origin? Uh, so, uh, uh, all of you are quite experienced, uh, but it just uh, I think it'd be good to remind ourselves that when you go through all this, when you have a, a, a person with abdominal pain in front of you, to think through systematically. Uh, these are the common ones. But what else can it be? Uh, let's talk about the less common ones that uh, we need to just watch out for. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that is always high on my list uh, that we do not ever, ever want to miss uh, is some sort of aortic aneurysm dissection, uh, whether in the thoracic or whether in the abdomen. Uh, uh, you know, it, it can present uh, uh, in, a, in a really catastrophic way, but it can also present in a kind of a, a prolonged uh, pain uh, that, that if it is a slow dissection, uh, that, that is wall off, uh, and then uh, you kind of assume that it is not something important. So, uh, aortic uh, triple A is always something to bear in mind. Uh, coronary artery disease, I, I always uh, do a, an ECG uh, if I'm not sure. Uh, the, 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 my cardiology colleagues uh, also uh, sent me a lot of uh, people who present to them first uh, with suspicion of coronary artery disease but subsequently turned out to be uh, a GI origin and vice versa. Uh, I had people with uh, coming in uh, thinking that it was a gastric problem, uh, subsequently turned out to be to have, uh, you know, coronary artery disease. So uh, coronary artery disease is one of the things that we have to keep in mind. Wait, is it pulmonary? Everything in the thorax can also give you abdominal pain. So uh, whether it's a uh, uh, pleural effusion, uh, 
whether it's, uh, you know, God forbid, a pulmonary embolism, uh, you know, uh, they can al also give you uh, an upper abdominal kind of uh, presentation. Uh, this you also do not want to miss. Uh, you know, uh, a, a, a pregnancy uh, test uh, or better HCG uh, would always uh, be high on my list if I see uh, a woman with uh, a ch uh, of childbearing age uh, coming in with strange pain. <coughs> Sometimes, uh, if I can explain the pain. Uh, Medical or metabolic uh, causes, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, hypercalcemia, Addison's. I've not seen a sickle cell crisis myself, but uh, they can also present, all these can present with uh, abdominal pain. So it's not just, uh, you know, a, a surgical quote unquote type of presentation, but also uh, a, uh, you have to keep in mind uh, this kind of metabolic uh, presentation. Uh, medication, always very important. I've lost track uh, of the uh, number of times that uh, somebody is on some kind of NSAID uh, or in these days and age, uh, antiplatelets like aspirin, uh, uh, clopidogrel, uh, or even the, the newest NOAX. Uh, in my experience, all of them causes some kind of dyspepsia. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, when they did study, there's some some medications are supposed to be better than others in terms of, you know, not causing GI symptoms. But uh, if you've seen them long enough, uh, you know, almost all of them will give you some kind of dyspepsia. Okay. Worm infestation uh, in Sabah. <laughs> you cannot rule this out. Uh, I just had <laughs> one, <laughs> uh, this diagnosis just, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were sure that this was Crohn's disease, but uh, when we went in to uh, do the scope, uh, <laughs> Lo and behold, uh, you know, uh, these crawly things uh, stay bad at me. And, uh, you know, and after we eradicated uh, the, the worms, uh, the symptoms went away. So, uh, these kind of things you must uh, always keep in mind. So, it's not just uh, the usual wonderful stuff. Uh, these are the things that can catch you up. You cannot talk about abdominal pain or indeed any kind of uh, medi uh, medical problem this in this pandemic without uh, asking this question. <laughs> Is this a COVID-19 uh, infection? Uh, how does uh, COVID-19 uh, 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 present uh, uh, as abdominal pain? Uh, okay, uh, let me just... Okay, this is a pathophysiology of GI COVID-19. Uh, as you know, uh, the 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 uh, COVID nine the target protein of uh, the virus is the angiotensin conversing and uh, converting enzyme two ACE two, uh, and uh, it's shown here uh, on the uh, as as uh, this uh, purple uh, kind of uh, structure. And although ACE two is predominantly expressed in the respiratory tract lining of the alveolar epithelial cells. It is also highly expressed in various types of GI cells. Uh, mainly, it is found in the respiratory tract, and that's how COVID gets into your body uh, through droplets and uh, into your lung and into the respiratory tract lining. But uh, it is but this protein that they target and they link to it's also on the uh, GI cells. In fact, uh, ACE two expression. Uh, is very, very high in the enterocytes, uh, in the small intestines, <clears throat> in the colon, and in the duodenum. Uh, in fact, uh, some, investig some studies have indicated that the level of ACE2 expression in the colonic enterocyte can be up to 100 times higher than those in the respiratory tract. Uh, it's just that uh, the respiratory tract is the, is the easier uh, uh, part to get to for the virus, and that's why they get into the virus into the lung first. Uh, you know, uh, if it is the other way around, we will be having uh, GI symptoms first rather than respiratory symptoms. So, uh, similar to how COVID enters the respiratory tract, the virus particle uh, enters the cells of the GI tract through this receptor, and they just attach themselves to the receptor here, uh, as like you saw, like you see here in the uh, the, the purple structure. <clears throat> and this, <clears throat> this interaction uh, 
uh, will disrupt the barrier function of this of this organ uh, and and altering and it, and it triggers a series of inflammatory responses, uh, release of cytokines, uh, chemokines, uh, alongside infiltration of neutrophils, macrophages, and T cells, similar to what's happening in the lung. So, uh, so this is uh, how the virus enter the GI uh, tract. So, GI symptoms in the era of COVID-19 uh, when people study it and look at large series, uh, they find that uh, diarrhea is actually presented, uh, it's found in about just over about 11%, 11.5% of people presenting with COVID-19. Nausea and vomiting, about, about 6%, and abdominal pain, about uh, just, uh, it's not so common, it's about uh, just under 3%. Now, the problem with uh, these symptoms uh, is that uh, when you look at the overall, 10% uh, of COVID patients have GI symptoms. Uh, but of the 10%, a lot of them only have GI symptoms without fever and cough for a very long time. So, uh, and average, on average, it's about 4 to 20 days prior to admission. So they have these symptoms about 4 to 20 days prior to admission. So when you look at this and you ask yourself, there, there are people with just GI symptoms walking around. There are COVID-positive patients that have GI symptoms that's walking around for about up to two weeks, okay, without the common, the usual fever and cough, the URTI symptoms, presenting to your clinics, okay? So, uh, this is why it is important to just keep your guards up, uh, that everyone who comes into your clinic is COVID positive until proven otherwise, whether or not they have fever or cough. And this slide here <clears throat> just shows you this. Yeah, 80% of the 10% who have GI symptoms, they have GI symptoms alone. Diarrhea, nausea, or abdominal pain without fever and cough. So, uh, keep your guts up, guys. <clears throat> so, very quickly, uh, what can you do in your clinic? Okay. Uh, i like to start with the basic. Uh, you know, a good history uh, is probably 90% of, <laughs> of your diagnosis. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you don't need me to tell you that uh, get as complete history as possible when someone comes in with uh, abdominal pain is the cornerstone of an accurate diagnosis. Right? Uh, uh, you know, I like to get uh, the location, uh, uh, the character, uh, and the onset uh, down. Uh, you know, uh, our, our body, uh, our our abdomen, uh, if you remember from embryology, uh, is divided uh, into foregut, midgut, and hindgut structures, right? Uh, so pain from the foregut structures, like the stomach, the pancreas, liver, biliary system, and the proximal duodenum, will typically be localized in the epigastric region, right? Typically. Uh, of course, there are atypical people, but typically, it is in the epigastric region. Uh, the rest of the small bowel and the proximal third of the colon, including the appendix, are mid-gut structures, right? Uh, and the pain that comes with these organs is normally perceived in the para-umbilical region. And the hindgut structure, such as the bladder uh, and distal two-thirds of the colon, uh, as well as the uh, pelvic organs, are usually uh, pain in the suprapubic region. Yeah, pain that is uh, referred to the back uh, is usually all for the retroperitoneal structures such as the aorta uh, or the kidneys, right? Uh, you know, character of pain, uh, we like to ask whether it's uh, dull, localizing, aching, gnawing pain. Uh, uh, this kind of pain are usually from uh, the organs, the viscerally innervated organs. Uh, 
compared to the uh, sharp pain and localized somatic pain uh, that is caused by the irritation of the peritoneum. Uh, uh, when you have uh, things like peritonitis, which is localized, uh, then you have the, the character of the, 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 the pain uh, changes from a dull to a more sharp pain. Right? Uh, so sometimes the character of the pain can tell you, uh, you know, uh, the the origin of the pain and also the uh, what kind of uh, pathology uh, is is going on. Uh, onset of pain, acute onset of pain, acute onset is usually more severe. Uh, as I said, uh, the foremost consideration of uh, acute severe pain in the abdomen, you have to think of triple uh, A aortic uh, dissection. Uh, other things that you need to think of is like perforated ulcer, uh, a volvulus, uh, mesentery ischemia, torsion. Uh, this sort of thing you need to keep in mind when you when you see a patient with acute pain. Uh, however, if the pain is not acute, it doesn't also necessarily mean that it is not severe. Uh, for example, a study has shown that uh, almost 40, almost 50% of elderly patients with a proven uh, perforated ulcer uh, does not report an acute onset of pain. Uh, this slow pain that is built up. Right? It's not like suddenly kind of pain. Right? And, and uh, things like uh, ischemia also typically present uh, with a, a gradual onset of pain until uh, something uh, really catastrophic happens in the abdomen. Uh, so uh, while uh, the onset is 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 uh, is, is important, uh, you need to keep in mind all these uh, things that can uh, be horrible uh, to miss. Uh, intensity, uh, of course, the more intense it is, probably the more severe it is. Uh, but I like to also remind you that in older patients, uh, old, old, especially. Uh, older stoic patient, they can really under-report uh, symptoms. Uh, I'm sure we've all come across a uh, patient like that, you know, uh, they, they could have something perforated inside and yet they tell you, tidak apa ba? Yeah, uh, tidak sakit. Uh, yeah. So, uh, we have a lot of stoic patients around uh, in our midst. Uh, radiation and referral of pain uh, also are, are important. Uh, the classic example is uh, if you have uh, shoulder pain, it might be something uh, disturbing the, the diaphragm. Uh, uh, that, that is a, a classic example. Uh, another uh, uh, other type of uh, referral pain could be uh, biliary, uh, biliary disease or uh, 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 liver uh, hematoma, uh, uh, you know, uh, irritating the diaphragm. Just some examples, yeah. So, uh, things like that, you need to keep in mind. Uh, duration and progression. Uh, persistent pain, persistent worsening pain, uh, you need to really uh, uh, pay attention. Uh, but, like I said before also, uh, in the elderly, sometimes uh, they can really throw you off uh, by under-reporting pain. And also, uh, people who are uh, on... Uh, steroid sometimes uh, can mask uh, really uh, bad things happening in the abdomen. So all these things you need to uh, really keep in mind. Provocative uh, and palliating factors. Uh, I'll talk about the coughing test afterward, uh, but uh, if you need to ask about what, what, what makes the pain worse, what makes the pain better. Uh, one of the things that I like to ask is, you know, uh, when you walk up the stairs or, or, or when you walk to my clinic, uh, how was the pain? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, pleuritic chest pain uh, will give you, will, will have more pain when you cough uh, uh, or when you breathe in. Uh, you know, uh, things like uh, peptic ulcer, uh, the pain of peptic ulcer can be relieved by eating. Uh, Mesentery ischemia can be exacerbated by eating, by food, you know, that sort of thing. So you need to ask about all these things. Okay. Uh, associate symptoms uh, like vomiting and, and, and bowel symptoms, 
are also uh, very important uh, to know. Uh, of course, uh, anorexia, vomiting, bowel habits. Vomiting, like, uh, you know what, what the, the, is a bilious vomiting, uh, whether they, they're vomiting out, of course, coffee ground vomit, uh, fresh blood, that one, you, that you, you, are, you are really sure that something is happening. Uh, it could be just uh, bilious uh, vomiting, uh, and, and that, that also uh, shows that uh, 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 something is happening uh, inside. Uh, feculent matters that's coming out. Uh, Non-productive retching, people, they keep retching and retching, uh, can be a, a, a sign of gastric volvulus. Uh, you know, all this kind of thing that you need to uh, keep in mind. One of the things that, uh, as general practitioner, I'm sure you don't miss this, uh, but uh, when somebody like myself who's, uh, you know, doing GI medicine for a long time, uh, sometimes we have to train ourselves to uh, keep asking uh, questions outside uh, our field of expertise, uh, which like genital urinary symptoms, gynecological, uh, and also uh, sexual uh, uh, history. Uh, this these things will uh, in 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 a in a uh, in a lady. Uh, sometimes we can get caught up uh, by uh, things like uh, pregnancy uh, and also uh, things like pelvic inflammatory uh, diseases or even pain from endometriosis. So uh, menstrual uh, symptoms, menstrual history sexual history, all those are very important to ask. So make sure that you don't miss them. Uh, and also non-abdominal causes, uh, like I said before, uh, whether it's uh, pulmonary or uh, cardiac in origin, all these things we need to ask. Past medical history, surgical history, current medication, uh, as I said before, they are all, uh, all are very important. Uh, the things that uh, to look out for, uh, uh, apart from keto diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, which which can present in Kusmao breathing. I myself, I had a case uh, a couple of months ago. A young man who came into my clinic, uh, just a bit tachypnic, but he actually came because he had abdominal pain. Uh, then when we woke him up, we actually found out that the pain from his abdomen was because of his rapid breathing and his sugar was 29, uh, you know, uh, he was having acidotic breathing. So that, that was a very clear sign of ketoacidosis uh, causing uh, abdominal pain and uh, because of his breathing and presenting. Uh, hypercalcemia is, is the other one that I mentioned, uh, but in our setting also uremia can also uh, uh, with uh, kidney failure can also present with abdominal pain uh, and uh, one rare things like lead poisoning, porphyria, uh, methanol intoxication. This, all this uh, we must also uh, uh, keep in mind. Uh, social history. Uh, social history uh, is important because the patient's use of drugs and alcohol uh, will also have a uh, very important uh, diagnostic implication. Especially these days, a lot of people are taking all sorts of uh, supplements, uh, direct sales, uh, over-the-counter, so you, you need to know. Uh, even recreational drugs. Uh, a couple of years ago, when uh, K or ketamine was uh, very popular, uh, we used to see uh, abdominal pain associated with recurrent use of these drugs. Uh, in fact, we even have a name for it. We call it K cramps. Yeah, uh, I remember uh, a young man uh, who came in with this abdominal pain, uh, which just defy all our investigation. And finally, I took him aside and I asked him uh, whether he uh, uses uh, such drugs and. Uh, he looked at me fishily and he admitted that, yes, he, is, uh, he uses his drug. So I cautioned him. I, I counseled him to, to stop the drugs. Uh, after, after two weeks, the, the pain got better. But uh, 
uh, as you probably also know, uh, care cramps doesn't completely go away. Uh, we also don't know what the pathophysiology is uh, of this uh, abdominal pain. So uh, just a, a case uh, in point to uh, alert you to social history uh, uh, pointing us to the diagnosis. So apart from a, a good history, a good physical examination is also, also very important. Uh, inspection, auscultation, uh, and percussion. Uh, Uh, for me, uh, auscultation uh, is uh, uh, th these are the bedrocks of, of uh, our diagnosis. Uh, from it, we uh, are able to uh, tell a lot of things. Uh, uh, I keep reminding myself uh, to do a complete examination by reminding myself that I've missed two cases of shingles. Okay, <laughs> abdominal pain from shingles. Uh, and uh, what happened was uh, this patient typically present with pain uh, and, and uh, a very diffuse pain, but uh, in the early stage before the onset of the uh, uh, vesicles, uh, it can be up to about one to two weeks before the onset of vesicles uh, to tell you that this is shingles. Uh, you know, we've been investigating, uh, 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 I've been investigating uh, the patient uh, and, and I couldn't find anything wrong uh, with the patient until the vesicle came up. So it is always important uh, to keep that in mind also and to keep out, to look out for uh, any sign that will point you to, uh, 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 you know, an uh, unusual uh, uh, diagnosis. But mind you, shingles is also not uncommon uh, in the community. So you will probably see more of them than I have. Uh, the other things that uh, we need to look out for uh, is, of course, things like grey turner sign uh, with, uh, uh, with a, a cullen sign with a bluish umbilic umbilicus with intraperitoneal bleeding. Uh, and, of course, with uh, abdominal distension, uh, you need to uh, see whether they've got ascites or not, uh, whether it is a, a large bowel obstruction uh, or ascites with shifting downness. Uh, in my in my experience, auscultation uh, has very limited uh, utility, uh, but uh, bowel sound is always important to, to listen to, and a bruy uh, telling you they've got uh, you know uh, renal stenosis, uh, aortic stenosis, uh, uh, you know that may point you to uh, some kind of diagnosis. Uh, palpation, uh, palpation is important. Uh, uh, when we use it to test for peritoneal irritation, especially in rebound and guarding. Uh, I find rebound uh, probably one of the most uh, uh, sensitive uh, uh, tools uh, in, in, dis in distinguishing an acute abdomen. Uh, the traditional rebound testing uh, in the studies uh, is, has a sensitivity uh, to detect peritonitis up to 80%, but the specificity is quite low, and 40 to 50%. Uh, so some people have suggested an indirect test, such as the cough test. If the patient still can cough, ask them to cough, uh, and looking for sign of pain when they cough. Uh, and a study has found that uh, when you do the cough test, uh, you have similar sensitivity to a rebound test, uh, but with a specificity of up to 80%. So a cough test, some people feel, are more uh, useful than a rebound test. Uh, a rebound test sometimes also causes unnecessary pain, especially in, in younger children. So uh, some people don't advise, uh, you know, doing rebound. Uh, very inhumane, they feel. Uh, in children, you can ask them to, uh, you know, if they still can, uh, they can, uh, maybe just jump about a bit and see whether uh, that brings on uh, the abdominal pain. Uh, guarding, uh, just, just a, a, a practice point on guarding. Uh, when I do uh, test for true guarding, uh, I always uh, 
look out for, I always time it with the respiratory cycle. Uh, with true guarding, uh, you will be able to detect the uh, guarding throughout the respiratory cycle. Uh, with controlled guarding, in the, like in some people, uh, you know, if they want to mask uh, their symptoms or they, they want, they're, they're not truly having guarding, uh, the tone will decrease when they inspire. So uh, through guarding, the, the tone will remain tense uh, throughout the respiratory cycle. So uh, like I said, uh, uh, I find this test uh, quite uh, important to distinguish whether people have acute abdomen. Rectal examination uh, must not be missed. Uh, there are uh, uh, pain, abdominal pain that can present uh, from, uh, you know, uh, rectal carcinoma and a rectal examination will just, uh, you know, reveal the truth when you put your fingers in. Uh, Carnet sign uh, is to detect abdominal wall tenderness. Uh, sometimes you don't know whether the, the pain is in the wall or, or, or in the organs uh, deeper down. So what you can do is you can ask, ask them to tense up their muscle by uh, performing a half sit up. So if the pain is worsened, if they tense their mus uh, abdominal wall, uh, that has a, a very high sensitivity to detecting uh, pathology in the abdominal wall and not the organ underneath. Murphy sign, cough test I've, I've, I've described. Murphy sign, all of us know, uh, right upper quadrant, uh, you they catches the breath if uh, if you put your hand, your fingers there uh, from pain and it is uh, usually a sign uh, of uh, cholecystitis. Uh, although it only has a sensitivity of sixty five percent, so an absent morphine sign does not mean you don't have cholecystitis. The psoas sign uh, again, uh, it's very important. It's, it it will tell you whether there's something pressing on the psoas muscle. Uh, we have, uh, I personally have used this to detect uh, TB psoas uh, abscess. Uh, so I find it very useful uh, and it's very easy to, to, to perform. Just ask the patient to raise their leg against, uh, 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 against your, your hand. If you press on your hand, ask them to raise their, their legs. And if they have pain, uh, that is positive psoas sign. Some other things that I, uh, I, I, need, I would like to, uh, just one point also, uh, if you need to give analgesia during your examination, although uh, in the primary care that may not happen so often, but if you do need to give analgesia uh, in, the, uh, in the primary care setting, you know, in, during our, our uh, houseman time, we are always taught that not to give uh, analgesia uh, to, to, to lesser the pain, uh, so that uh, it will not mask the pain and when the uh, specialists come, uh, they will be able to, uh, you know, examine the patient properly. Uh, but actually, uh, these days and age, uh, that has been superseded uh, by studies that shows that uh, you can administer up to 15 milligrams of morphine. Uh, it does not affect diagnostic accuracy uh, in patients with acute abdominal pain. So uh, if you need to, just relieve their pain. Uh, while you need to examine them. Uh, but I don't uh, probably think that you have uh, a lot of opportunity to do this or a lot of need to do this in your primary care setting. Okay, so what else can you do in your, in your clinic? Of course, uh, if you suspect that they have COVID, uh, you screen them. Uh, our threshold for COVID screening is very low and so should yours. Uh, COVID screening tests these days are easier and cheaper to do uh, and they are widely available. Uh, so uh, if you have to, just do one. Better to be safe uh, than sorry. Uh, uh, if you can do ECG in your clinic, uh, if you think that there's any uh, suspicion, uh, do an ECG. In fact, do an ECG anyway. Uh, it'd be good to uh, have a baseline uh, if you're going to uh, thinking of sending the patient on to a hospital. Uh, and that if you can do ultrasound in your clinic, uh, that will be very helpful. Uh, 
uh, and also that will help you to distinguish a lot of things. Uh, a simple ultrasound, uh, you know, the, of the gallbladder, simple ultrasound of the pancreas will tell you lots of things. Uh, and also, you know, distinguish between ascites uh, uh, or, or uh, other things. Yeah. Uh, chest x-ray, uh, again, uh, if you can do and if you need to do. Uh, and of course, in the, in your, after you go through all that and you feel that this is not uh, an acute abdomen, uh, this is something that you can uh, uh, treat uh, from your clinic, by all means, go ahead, uh, trial of treatment, uh, medication, lifestyle. We can talk about this in a question and answer time uh, of the not so acute abdomen. Uh, so, the last question is, when should you refer? Uh, well, the short answer is anytime you're worried. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, that's, the, that's the shortest answer. But of course, uh, you know, we are doctors, so we have to uh, talk uh, sensibly and uh, through the process. Uh, what are the GI red flags? When should you consider uh, referring? Some are actually, uh, these are mostly just uh, common sense uh, that, you know, when you see them, you know they should be referred. <laughs> when the patient is, is confused, uh, impaired consciousness, uh, they could be having, you know, uh, hepatic encephalopathy, uh, you know, uh, this one is a no-brainer, uh, you know, when they're septic, when they're shocked, uh, you know, when dehydrated, hypotension. Uh, of course, you may want to start IV drips in your clinic first beforehand, uh, start, uh, you know, if you have the time or uh, uh, that might be life-saving, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, GI bleed, hematemesis, melina, it's, it's, it's a big, big uh, 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 reason to refer. Uh, if you're mm. suspecting medical causes, uh, as I said, like uh, ketoacidosis, uh, uh, hypercalcemia, uh, or any sort of things that you, you, you really don't want to handle in your clinic. Uh, weight loss is the other one. Some, uh, I find that the last two years uh, since the uh, pandemic, it's very difficult to ask people about weight loss. Uh, <laughs> mainly because... Uh, some people are losing weight naturally, you know, from whatever, uh, uh, stress, la, uh, eating less. La. Uh, some people are also exercising more because, you know, they, are, they have more time, you know, they, they run around their tamans, you know, uh, every day now instead of once a week last time. Uh, or, uh, you know, they just have poorer appetite uh, or they want to lose weight. You know, so uh, you, you, uh, weight loss is one of these one, one, one of these symptoms that uh, you, you, you just need to dig a little bit deeper. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some people, some patients who are lying very still. Uh, you know, you got to really think that they have some serious uh thing going on. Uh, rigid abdomen. Uh, as I said, uh, sign of peritonitis. Uh, guarding. Uh, rebound. Uh, tenderness on percussion. Uh telling you that this is probably uh, peritonitis or some kind of inflammatory process that's going on, uh, absence of altered bowel sound, uh, thinking that this is, uh, you know, uh, ileus or, or, or abdominal uh, obstruction. Uh, one of the things that we always must look at is the testis uh, yeah, uh, in men, uh, obviously. Uh, uh, we have, I have personally found uh, testicular mass uh, by just going down there. Sometimes even without, uh, without the, aware, the, the, even the patient himself did not, was not aware of this. So testicular uh, examination is simple to do, uh, but uh, can uh, give a very useful yield. So uh, when else to refer? Uh, when the symptoms persist or recur? Uh, I, I get a lot of referral uh, when uh, uh, my colleagues here in primary care uh, treat them with uh, treat you know uh, what seems to be GERD or or uh, dyspepsia with PPI with antacid and and they don't get better or they recur uh, so that is also a good time to refer. Uh, the other things that I want you to think about is uh, not 
not only you refer when you are when you have uh, a reason to because of the abdominal pain, but also uh, sometimes to uh, because they are visiting you, uh, you can take the opportunity to screen them, uh, to screen them for have family history of of, uh, of cancer like colon cancer. In my particular field, I'm 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 always watching out for uh, colon cancer. Uh, and uh, you know, do uh, fecal occult blood, uh, referring them for colonoscopy screening, uh, and also uh, lately, uh, in the last uh, year or so, we've started doing this uh, screening call, uh, the Fit Four score, which is to look out for uh, fatty liver disease. Methyl D uh, is now the new uh, name for Nash. Uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Uh, you can do simple uh, scoring tests uh, in your clinic and that will give you a score that says this patient, whether this patient has a significant uh, liver fibrosis or not, just from uh, the full blood count and the, uh, and the liver function test. So it's a very simple uh, scoring to do. Uh, I've given a whole talk on it. Um, and you probably can find on, on, on YouTube as well. Uh, but fit four score, uh, many people have given talk. Uh, you can look at it. So I, I've always, I'm always uh, on the lookout for uh, people uh, with methyl D uh, with significant fibrosis. So uh, that has come to the end of my presentation. I, uh, I'm only, you know, some, a, a topic like abdominal pain, you can't really cover everything. So uh, I've given you uh, a, a kind of a four question thing to, to as a thought process uh, to, to process people uh, in your, uh, when people with pain come into your clinic uh, so that you can separate the, uh, you know, the people that are really serious from the people that uh, are not so serious. So uh, uh, I hope that uh, will benefit you. Uh, if you have any question or answer, uh, I'm ready to, I'm happy to try and uh, answer them. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kian Chen, for that very informative and interesting uh, presentation. Uh, before we start addressing the session here in the YouTube uh, platform, I have a question of uh, my own. Yeah. Um, uh, the reason why we were In uh, GP, most patients uh, who's coming with epigastric pain usually self diagnosed because with dyspepsia, mm -hmm. dyspepsia, or otherwise in Baba known as epigastric plus. <laughs> so, um, uh, not only that they self diagnosed with epigastric, but usually they end up get that diagnosis also from the GP also. Mm -hmm. So, you get all this epigastric left right and center. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So what is your comment on that? Okay. Uh, as, as I have uh, uh, presented in my talk, uh, the most important thing that you, you need to uh, figure out is, uh, is this actually sarcic gastric or is this other thing? And in the, in the flow, in the thought process, uh, the most important thing you need to uh, figure out is, 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 should I, is, is this an acute abdomen? Is this a serious uh, problem that I need to uh, refer uh, for for more tests for more uh, you know for treatment so uh, so that's why I, I I presented it it like that uh, from your point of view if you can get a good history uh, and a good examination uh, a lot of this circuit gastric you can reclassify them uh, uh, into uh, what I've just uh, presented. Uh, basically, the most important thing you need to know is 
whether this is it is serious or important, right? Uh, after you excluded that, uh, then you have more more room to play. So, like I say, think through all the all the all the different uh, possible uh, organs or diagnosis where the pain could be, because everyone is different. But specifically, if you're talking about uh, pain from the stomach. Uh, uh, itself, uh, the the uh, if I understand your your question correctly, is uh, what what are the most common causes, correct? Okay. Or, yeah, okay. Uh, the most common causes that I see in my clinic uh, can be classified as non ulcer dyspepsia. Uh, non ulcer dyspepsia is kind of a uh, uh, heterogeneous. Uh, n- uh, it's a term for a group of heterogeneous uh, symptoms, right? Uh, and, and also causes, uh, it ranges from uh, too much acid uh, to, uh, to hypersensitive uh, 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 stomach uh, to, uh, you know, uh, abnormal mobility of the stomach to get, to get the food out or get the gas out. Uh, so, so, uh, so that, that, in a, that is the most common that I see. The second most common is actually acid reflux. Acid reflux. Uh, uh, Whether it's due to a higher hernia uh, or not, uh, acid reflux is is very common as as you probably realize uh, uh, by now. Uh, So these two basically takes up uh, probably 80-90% of uh, of uh, epigastric pain uh, or abdominal pain that presents from my to my clinic, uh, I very seldom see uh, a typical peptic ulcer. In fact, if I see a peptic ulcer these days, uh, it's like wow! It's like you know, <laughs> it's like going back to uh, Queen's Day, you know, <laughs> twenty years ago when you see. Uh, proper peptic ulcer. I have probably not seen a proper peptic ulcer for a long time. Yeah, I mean like a proper, proper peptic ulcer. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, in a sense, that's, that's what we are dealing with uh, mostly. Uh, and of course, there's a dreaded gastric carcinoma. Uh, yeah, uh, but those are, again, uh, not very common, uh, thankfully. Uh, but when they do present, they usually present very late. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I, was, I, I, I agree with that. As you mentioned, that there is a stoma because of these two conditions. And what would you suggest or uh, recommend to us as a GP uh, in terms of medication against the uh, first encounter while we are arranging for the test? And, uh, we usually give uh, some kind of uh, uh, sexual antagonist and uh, all this uh, MSG. Do you think that kind of reasonable or should we spend a bit more time to be more specific on our I, I think uh, I think if you have taken a good history and a, a done a good examination and you are happy that this is not an acute abdomen, then you have more space and more time to uh, to deal with it. So uh, I, I feel that uh, relieving symptoms is always our first duty. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we can tell the patient exactly what they have if they're still in pain. It doesn't help them very much. <laughs> so to me, uh, to relieve their symptoms is always uh, number one. Uh, and I think uh, if you can relieve their symptoms while you're waiting for uh, to arrange for investigation, uh, or to see whether the treatment is working, I think that is that that is what I would do as well. Uh, I think as doctors, we we must first relieve suffering. Yeah, whether or not we can give them another an answer, uh, yeah, comes later. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Jian Cheng. Okay, we'll uh, start addressing the question in the YouTube platform uh, yeah. now. I think we got two questions there at the moment. The first one is from Amirul Salahuddin Manan. How do you suspect the abdominal pain is due to COVID infection? <laughs> uh, 
The short answer is you can't uh, until uh, you know other things present. Uh, you know, it's there is no specific uh, symptom that says this is COVID diarrhea, this is non-COVID diarrhea, uh, or this is COVID pain, this is non-COVID pain. Uh, usually, these people. That's why. That's why these people present late. Uh, you know, for uh, four to twenty days before before admission. Uh, it's because people don't know they have COVID. So a short answer is unfortunately we can't tell unless they also have, you know, other accompanying sign fever. Uh, then you go and do a COVID swab test. Uh, my my point is, uh, if you seeing patient in your clinic, everyone is positive until proven otherwise. So put on your mask, put on your screen, be very vigilant, and that goes for your staff as well. Sometimes you are good, but your staff. Go and eat in the pantry. Go and take the mask off. Go and tapau next door. Ah, that's where they get their stuff. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Next question is from Sophia Joseph. Can you share with us a little bit more on the worm infestation case you mentioned? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. This this patient actually had uh had symptoms suggestive of inflammatory bowel disease. In fact, he was diagnosed a couple of years ago with inflammatory bowel disease. So uh, when, uh, when, the, when the patient came in, of course, our first thought is uh, this is a flare-up of the inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and in all presentation, in, you know, it, 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 it felt like that. Uh, you know, he had the right pain, the right location. <laughs> okay. Uh, the right presentation, uh, but when we scoped him, uh, when I scoped him, uh, I didn't see any serious inflammation in the colon, uh, and but I saw uh, worms uh, in the uh, ileocecal region, uh, and that changed the diagnosis. And of course, uh, you know, uh, you can have worms and inflammatory bowel disease at the same time. Uh, but we treated the worm and he got better. So, yeah, so that was the worm infestation. So I, I just want to uh, uh, bring to your attention that, uh, you know, uh, this day and age, uh, we still need to think about worm infestation, especially uh, in the rural areas. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. John. Um, we don't have any question anymore at the moment. All right. Thank you for all the uh, participating audience today. Soon we'll be displaying our QR code. Please scan them for your CPD point using the MMA apps. Or you can register your name at the link given earlier in the chat group if you have troubles um, scanning the QR code. Thank you to our Secretariat, Ms. Melissa and Mr. Adrian, for their assistance. Thank you to our sponsor, PetLab, and most of And <laughs> thank you also again to Dr. John Ching for allocating his time to our teachers this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rizin, and thank you for spending your time, your precious time on Sunday evening with me instead of with your family. Appreciate that. I hope you've learned something tonight. We'll see you again in two weeks' time. Are we still on? Are we still on? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Ahmad. Thank you for your question. Uh, usual treatment for non-ulcer dyspepsia. Yeah. Uh, usually, uh, when they come to me, uh, and uh, uh, they would have tried a few things from uh, people like yourself, uh, you know, have given him them PPI or antacid. Uh, and when they come to me, it's usually never the first line. Uh, they would have gone to, you know, gone through a, 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 a processes of, uh, of trial and treatment. Uh, so when they come to me, I have the advantage of scoping them uh, if, if they agree. So uh, with the scope, uh, I can usually uh, discern uh, better uh, how to treat them. So I have that advantage over you. Uh, uh, so usually I will treat them 
according to the endoscopy finding. Uh, if I don't find anything uh, uh, and classify them as non ulcer dyspepsia, I will still use uh, the same thing, uh, PPI or different PPI uh, or antacid. But a lot of the time, these people will need uh, lifestyle modification as well. Uh, you'd be surprised at the uh, number of people that uh, do not eat uh, on time or, you know, uh, eat whenever they want, uh, eat whatever they want, uh, you know. Uh, so, modification of lifestyle is 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 one thing. Uh, in fact, a lot of the time, non ulcer dyspepsia is treated with lifestyle modification rather than medication. The medication is, uh, I always tell them, is uh, to give you time and give you space to, uh, to uh, how should you say, uh, to build a lifestyle that can sustain you. Uh, uh, through the years. So, uh, medication first, but uh, with lifestyle modification uh, uh, later on. So, these people need a lot of talking to. Yeah, the talk is as important as the medication. Yeah, so uh, I hope that's helpful. Uh, in a busy clinic like a private, uh, private practitioner clinic, you may not have that luxury, uh, but in fact, uh, I feel that sometimes that is what is needed. Uh, they have to know what is at stake and how they can uh, take care of their own prob uh, take care of th their own uh, symptoms uh, uh, and, and empower them to do so. Yeah. Thank you, Omar, and thank you, Dr.